Welcome back to Math for Game Developers, where, okay. <laughs> Welcome back to Math for Game Developers, where I'm excited to do a video about um, fast inverse square roots. Uh, so why do you want a fast inverse square root? Let's say you want to normalize a vector x, and we do that, as we know, by taking the vector x and dividing it by the le its length. But Floating point division is slow, and finding the square root to get this length is slow. So we can, uh, if we can do this instead, we do x dot x, and then we raise it to the negative one half power, which is an inverse square root. So that's the same as this right here. It's divided by the square root. Um, then if we have a really fast function for doing this inverse square root, then we can find the, the, the normal length vector very quickly. And so that's what this function does. Uh, and it, this fast uh, inverse square root function was found in the Quake 3 source code after John Carmack open sourced it. Um, and I think it's still kind of a mystery who made it. And it's, it's, Honestly, a mystery if you've never seen it before, how it works. You have this weird magic number. What is this? Like, how, why do we left right shift by one here? Uh, what is all of this junk right here? Like, how does that? So we're going to try and demystify it a little bit in this video. So the reason that this video comes on the heels of my floating point and fixed point iteration or, or Newton iteration videos is because this is a bunch of jiggering around with the floating point value inside the number um, to get an estimate. And this guy right here is actually a Newton iteration. So it's exactly the sort of stuff that we've been doing, which is why I'm really excited to cover right now. So I'm going to press pause on the estimate part, and we're going to talk about the Newton iteration part first. Let's see. So we have to find some function that has a root that is, in other words, the value of the function is zero at the point where our square root is, our inverse square root is, okay? So let's follow a few steps. We're going to derive a function that whose value is at zero when the inverse square root of x it is uh, when when like our value is the inverse square root of x. Okay, so x naught is the function that we want to be kind of close to the inverse square root of x. So it will it will be an estimate, right? And then. So if this is true, if x naught is the is is about equal to the um, the inverse square root of x, then if I square both sides, then we'll see that x naught squared is about equal to x to the negative one. And now I'm going to take the reciprocal of both sides, and we'll see that x naught. Uh, to the negative two power is about equal to x. And if that is true, if this x naught and this x are about the same, then x naught to the negative two power minus x, the difference between them should be about equal to zero, right? And when x naught is exactly zero, I'm sorry, is exactly the square root of, okay. When x naught is exactly the inverse square root of x, then it will be exactly zero. So this will work just fine to be my function of x naught that I'm going to do root finding on. When x naught is, I'm sorry, when the inverse square root, let me get this right here. When x naught is about the inverse square root of x, then f will be zero. I think I said that right. So um, once we have a good estimate, x naught, for the inverse square root of x, 
then we can apply Newton iteration. So let's recall from the last video how Newton iteration worked. To get the next iteration, xn plus 1, you say xn minus f of xn over f prime of xn. Okay? And we know what f is in this case, so we just have to figure out what f prime of x naught is. And we can use the power rule to do this, like we discussed in, in my uh, uh, video on derivatives and how to take derivatives. The negative 2 comes down, so you get negative 2 x naught. And then uh, you have to decrease the power, so that turns into negative 3. And then for this term, the x term, uh, x is actually a constant in this function because this is a function of x naught. And so that just goes away completely. So now we have enough to do some substitution here. And we get, so this goes right here, x naught to the negative 2 minus x over, and now we're going to put this down here, negative 2 x naught to the negative 3. And I'm going to squeeze this down here. When you simplify this, you get 3 halves x n uh, minus 1 half x n cubed times x. Uh, so there are a few steps that I skipped here, and I'll leave that to you as, a, as an exercise. If you don't believe me, um, just take this and simplify it, and you'll get that. And you'll, and you'll notice that now this looks exactly like this step right here. We have y, y and our x naught is their y, and you have y times 3 halves. And then uh, we have y times y times y times the original x, but half of it. So half of the original x. So you can see that these, these two equations are the same. So it does a, a Newton iteration to get to the next, uh, the next better estimate of, of our number. So then the only question is, what is this estimate up here? Well, so it takes y, which is our number, it finds its address, and casts it to a long pointer, which is like an integer pointer, um, and then dereferences that pointer. So what that does is, instead of co converting the number from a floating point number to an integer, uh, rather it it takes the num it takes the bits from the floating point number and interprets that as an integer. So it's getting at the actual bits of that floating point number uh, and manipulating them directly instead of having the, the, you know, the computer convert it to the equivalent value of a long. So um, this guy right here is actually messing around with the individual bits of the floating point number. And the part that I'm the most interested in is this part right here, the OX5F, F. okay? So remember from our floating point number video, we learned that there's one sign bit and then there are a bunch of, um, a bunch of exponent bits, okay? And in this case, in this case for this number right here, this 5F, this 5f, the exponent bits that correspond to 5f are this, okay? So here are the exponent bits. Here's the sign bit, which is going to be 0, which, by the way, is always going to be 0 because this is always going to be a positive number. You can't take a square root of a negative number. And then after, so we have 8, we have one sign bit, then we have 8 exponent bits, and then we have 23 significant bits, okay? So this number right here is the OX 5F part, 5F part of this, um, of this magical number. And that ends up being equal to the number 189, which is going to be important later. Okay, but I'm going to call this, I'm going to call this E, this exponent E. So there are two things we didn't talk about much in the floating point video. Um, 
In the floating point video, we talked about floating point numbers as if they were base 10, but I may have mentioned that they're actually stored in computers as base two. So this floating point, so this, um, so this is gonna be actually two to the E instead of 10 to the E, okay? So whatever this number is right here, this E, it gets raised to two instead of 10. The other thing I didn't mention is there's actually what's called a bias. Whatever these numbers are in the, uh, in the exponent bits of the floating point number, the number 127 is subtracted from them, okay, to get the actual floating point number. So this is 189. So 189 minus 127 is uh, 62. So this number is actually two to the 62 instead of two to the 189. Um, but two to the 62 is not important here. What's important is that uh, the floating, oh, okay, and then there are 23 numbers, 23 bits that come after this that form the significant. We're actually gonna be ignoring the significant because we can get a pretty good estimation of the of the inverse square root. Like we can get a pretty good first estimation if we just completely ignore the significant entirely. So we're just gonna assume for the sake of this video that the significant is one, okay? Um, so this is almost like taking this magic number and making it zero, 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 right? Uh, you, you still get a pretty good, est like the estimate that is in this code is, is, is obviously better in, in, in their case, but you still get a pretty good result if, even if you put these to zero. So we're gonna put them to zero just as an example. So what happens if you take your floating point number and you right shift it by one, okay? We have, we have I is, is, is the bits, is the exponent bits here for the floating point number that we're trying to estimate. So when you right shift something by one, it's like dividing it by two. And remember the sign bit is always zero because we're always finding the, you know, the square root of a positive number. So we're gonna shift a zero in right here and, and so this is going to be this is going to be equivalent to uh, something in a new color, two to the e over two minus one twenty seven. Okay. Um, that's what the that's what the shifting right by one does. It um, it divides the exponent by two, and it also divides the significant by two. Um, but we're ignoring the significant, so we don't care about that. So next, we do 5f. 5f is the exponent part. So we do um, ox 5f. And let me do this. Let me do this. 2 to the ox 5f minus e over 2 minus 127, right? We do this. Ox 5f minus. So, um, so this 189, this is actually 189 right here, gets subtracted into the uh, the exponent. And when you simplify this, it comes out to uh, 62 minus e over 2. Okay. So this ends up being a really good estimate for. Like this formula right here gives you a really good estimate for for the um, for the inverse square root. It just happens to, and I'll show you how. Let's say that my number is two to the negative six, a really small number, point oh 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 one. Oh 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 one. Yeah. So my number is two to the negative six. Okay. That means my exponent is going to be let's see negative six. So I'm going to have a negative six right here, or, or no, I'm sorry. I want this whole thing to be negative six. Uh, that means I have to have a one, 121 is gonna be my E, all right? Because if I say 121 minus 127, that gives me negative six, okay? So my E value is gonna be 121. So let me plug E into this formula and the formula is 62 minus E over two then that turns out to be two. So that it's 62 minus 121 over two turns out to be two. 
And so 2 to the 2 is 4. If I want to take the inverse square root of 2 to the negative 6, okay, and I want to take the inverse square root, then that will be 2 to the 3. And so that's only one order, of, and that's 8. So 4 is only one order of magnitude off. So it's not bad. Like, the actual code gets a better, um, a better estimate than this. We got 4, the actual answer is 8. But it's, it's still pretty good. Like, it's, it's within the ballpark. Um, if I have 2 to the 10, then my E value has to be uh, 137 because 137 minus 127 is 10. And then if I do 162 minus 137 over two, that gets me negative six. And two to the negative six is, uh, two to the negative six is, you know, 0 0.00001, 0 0.0001, something like that. Uh, no, that's not entirely accurate. Anyway, it's a small number. Now, if I'm taking two to the 10 and I raise it to the inverse square root, then multiplying these two guys together, I want to have something about two to the negative five. And two to the negative six, two to the negative five, it's pretty close. It's pretty close. So you can see that this, this magic number um, subtracted through the uh, through the bits of the floating point number actually does give us a fairly decent estimate, and um, and that's just with our crummy ox5f number with all of these zeros. The actual number gives an even better estimate, um, and so now let's I, this video is already way too long, but now let's go to a code section and see how our estimate does against the actual estimate. So here we are, and um, here you see I do the fast inverse square root twice. Once using my number, that is just uh, our simple um, estimate using the exponent uh, 5f. And here's the actual magic number, which who knows how the person came about that, but it, it actually um, turns out to be very good. But we're going to do it uh, both ways, and we're going to see who wins, okay? So we've already built this, yes. So let's go run it. And I'm gonna scroll up. We're gonna see what happens when we do, this is two to the negative six right here. We're gonna find the inverse square root of two to the negative six and the actual answer is that it should be eight, okay? So my formula takes two to the negative six and turns it into two to the two, just like we saw from, uh, from, the, coat, from the blackboard portion of the video. And um, when you include whatever's going on with the significant, that turns out to be six. I know two to the two is four, but there's other stuff in the significant, and so that it turns out to be six in total. So my estimation using my OX5F000 method is six, when the actual result is eight. So that's, that's not terrible. Um, maybe with some new iteration, we can do better, and we get, with one iteration, we get to 7.312, which is better but we're gonna need some more iterations. You can see that his number, whoever or she, whoever programmed this, um, his number was 7.729, and then after one iteration turned into 7.98, which is 0 0.02, less than 0 0.02 away from the actual number, which is pretty good. That's pretty damn good. So let's go see what happens with two to the 10, which is the other number we examined. Here's two to the 10. Um, which is 1024, and the answer should be about 0 0.0312. That's uh, inverse square root of 1024. So then um, 2 to the 10, my method, you remember, takes 2 to the 10 to 2 to the negative 6, which ends up being about 0 0.023, uh, is my estimation. So 0 0.023, 0 0.0312, not too, not too bad, not too much difference. Um, after one iteration, it gets to 0.028, but you can see the original code does 0.0331. That is even closer. That's pretty good. So hopefully this has somewhat demystified the fast inverse square root method. Uh, join us next time where we are going to talk about cubic interpolation.
See you then.